you might not think of yourself as an angry person. And I wouldn't want you to start identifying with your anger and taking on a new identity, which is bound to crumble and collapse in the same way that I don't want you to be a sad person. However, I'll admit this is somewhat of a weird edit because I've never accepted sponsorships on this channel. I will not sell you things I don't believe in, but I do believe in my own course. And the video that you're about to watch is from my new shadow work library, Deep Dive Journey into the Realms of Darkness. And this particular module is from module six on somatic therapy, where your body is actually your shadow. This is the lecture on anger. We've also got lectures on depression, anxiety, addiction, exercises on mirror work and mapping your trauma timeline. It is a golden module and honestly my favorite module in the entire course. I know you shouldn't have favorites, kind of like picking your favorite child, but module six is really my favorite module. I've put so many years of research behind this library and I cannot wait to share it with you. But in the meantime, just so you can get a taste for what's behind closed doors, you're going to see the full unedited lecture from the Shadow Work Library. And it's one of the hard hitters because I really let my own personal story with anger, rage and depression come through in a way which is hopefully not a trauma dump, but actually more of an informative role modeling and example setting. That's all we're going to say. I'm sponsoring my own video. My course is now out. I love this course. It has been my passion project for many years and I can't wait for you to experience it. But in the meantime, enjoy the video, enjoy working with your anger and remember that your body is indeed your shadow because it's not just an unconscious territory lost off in some kind of imaginal realm. This is also the place that we repress and dissociate and it's up to you to come back into your natural home. I hope you enjoy the video and click the link in the description if you want to go further with me. I'm going to bet that almost every single person in this course has something that's happened and maybe multiple things that have happened in their past or maybe even happened this week, which you are well justified to be angry about. Mainstream thinking would tell us that the person with anger issues is some form of unstable and delusional cretinous creature and that should not be trusted because they've clearly lost their marbles, but I'm more concerned about the well-mannered and very polite man or woman whose smile covers up their silent screams. I'm going to be bringing out a quote from Alexander Lowen about the reasonable man or the reasonable woman in just a moment, but today we're going to be exploring how to access, unlock, release, and work through repressed anger issues, especially if you don't consider yourself to be an angry person. We're going to be making connections to all of those sudden energetic collapses, all of those sullen moods and all of those seething moments. And of course, as we saw in the taking inventory exercise, all of these compulsive things like picking our hands, biting our nails, pulling out our hair, scrubbing ourselves too much in the shower, they often indicate unresolved anger. So we're going to be exploring that today. We're going to go through a bit of theory to begin with, a bit of framing, and then I'm going to give you a wide variety of practical choices of personal somatic therapeutic work. We're also going to be using a tea towel, one of the easiest possible tools that everyone has. A towel, a tea towel, a bath towel, a blanket, something that you can, well, I'll, I'll leave that for later. We'll go into what you can do with a tea towel or two work on your anger. Let's go into Alexander Lowen and make a point at the very beginning for someone who is so heavily self-repressive of their anger that they would not even allow themselves to admit that they could possibly be an angry person. You probably aren't all that extreme. You wouldn't end up in a course like this if you had zero capacity to accept that, yeah, sometimes I, I do actually get quite angry. Sometimes I can even be quite rageful. I never express it. God forbid I'd ever actually shout at someone or even raise my voice and I'd never push someone away from me. I'd never, I'd never do that. But let's just see where that goes. Quote from Alexander Lowen in the chapter on betrayal of the body, chapter 12, reclaiming the body. Quote starts a little bit ambiguous and overall, and then we go into the specifics for this lesson. The person who rejects the irrational negates the infant within him. This is after a few chapters on how the inner child is suppressed and a variety of emotional responses, things we've covered elsewhere. He has learned, unfortunately, again, gender towards man in this example. It's men and women the same. He has learned, unfortunately, that it's no use crying. Mother never comes anyway. He makes few demands on life because he has been taught early that his demands were unreasonable. 
He doesn't become angry because anger had always provoked retaliation. That's one of the big hints for why we struggle to express our anger. There was a moment in childhood, multiple moments in childhood, where we were punished physically, emotionally, spiritually in some cases, some kind of deep wounding, some deep punishment for being the little boy or little girl who was willing to say, that crosses my boundaries, I don't like this, stop. Doesn't often go down well with our parents, so that's where the main blockages tend to come from. And of course, polite society, we also heavily repress any anger. If you want actually a bit of a, I will continue with this quote, my personal belief is that anger is the most heavily stigmatized emotion. It's not sadness or anxiety or even sadness. Look at the news now. Sadness is everywhere. It's one of the main talking points. The same as opening up about mental health and men being willing to cry and I'll oh, just let it all out and it's okay for men to cry. Do you ever hear an argument about it's okay for men to be angry? No, because there's obviously massive shadow issues in society. There's things like domestic abuse, statistically speaking. The majority of domestic abuse cases, at least physical domestic abuse cases, are men assaulting women. If you actually look deeper in statistics, there's a lot of verbal abuse from women towards men. I'm not going to make it a very charged topic. There is good reason to be cautious about male anger, but we're not working with it. And female anger is almost an unexpressed topic just so heavily repressed. We do not want to touch our rage. We don't want even the possibility that we could go into vengeful space because many of us deep down worry that if we take the lid off of that volcanic pit of unexpressed, oh, that all of that, that we'd never stop. It's the same worry for the man who has anger issues, who worries that if he actually spent an hour on the punching bag and then took five minutes of meditation afterwards to put his hand on his heart he'd probably cry. Beneath anger is sadness, and often sadness can be a mask for anger. It's an interesting double take, but I think that anger is one of the most heavily stigmatized emotions in our current society, our current culture. Sadness isn't, anxiety isn't, sexuality isn't. So much of that has been destigmatized. De de anger is deep in the shadows. Problematic space, but the point still stands. Continuing the quote, he doesn't become angry because anger had always provoked retaliation. He has become a reasonable man, but in the process he has lost the motivation of pleasure and the aliveness of his body. He has, in this process, developed a schizoid tendency. The particular character structures that you'll have to read for in yourself, I'm not emphasizing them just here, but schizoid being something which, for simplicity's sake, is being way too in your head and deadened in the body. That's overly simplified. We'll continue. Yet the irrational breaks through in perverse forms. He finds himself subject to violent rages, depressions, and strange compulsions. He feels withdrawn and detached or overwhelmed and embroiled. The healthy person accepts his feelings even when they run counter to the apparent logic of the situation. And that's an interesting point because a lot of the repressed anger that we start to stack up in childhood and then continually top up in adulthood is that we actually if it's almost contradicting what Lewin says here he says that the healthy person accepts his feelings even when they run counter to the apparent logic of the situation you're in the workplace someone did something that stepped onto your project and you feel an anger response but you pause within a second and go no i'm not going to shout at my colleague that would be ridiculous that's so out of proportion they, they didn't know. There was an assumption, and yeah, sure, there's some work and I need to deal with, and that's a bit frustrating. A moment like that is so normal. Or a moment where your partner does something, which is they assumed something, or they didn't do something, they forgot something. There's that moment of anger, and our logic would say, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm just, yeah, let's let this slide. It would be completely irrational for me to blow up right now. There's something about that moment, that, that second or two when the anger arises, that if you have the ability to contain that, not repress it, there's a big difference between repression and containment. For example, you're in a dispute with your partner, they share something with you that's upsetting or anger-inducing, and rather than, and then you unleash on them, you still feel that energy, and you have the ability to contain it and communicate it appropriately, and you say, hey, I just want to get this clear, I'm, I'm feeling upset about this right now, did you intend this, can I get a bit more information? I, I'm not 
overly angry, but there's something really frustrating about this. Like, of course, you need to be in a conscious relationship to have this communication in the first place. There's many instances in the polite workplace environment where you won't even have a conversation like this because it's unprofessional. But there's only so many dozens of these instances that you can stack up before eventually, bioenergetically speaking, the rage will arise from your guts or the heat will be in your hands and it will rise up to here and you'll you'll choke it down and you will get a tight tight throat i've had clients report a feeling of subjectively having a concrete slab cutting off their throat and you'll see it in some people or even in sessions i'll see as they get angry this is insane to look at like it's normal but also it's crazy when you realize this and if you have this pattern just pay attention what will happen is they'll be talking about something that's anger inducing and they'll get really red in the chest up until about this point or maybe just here, maybe just below the Adam's apple for men, they'll have complete redness and anger and then nothing and they won't be able to express it. They haven't unlocked the ability to express anger vocally or through their expression. So they could be saying something that's really anger inducing and they've got that mask as we explore in the mirror work exercise. They've got that mask. They're saying they're angry, but it's not actually coming through. They're not actually articulating why they're off. This is why we do the work in private, because of course it can be quite terrifying and socially speaking there is something to be said for containing our expression, but if we perpetually numb the genuine reactions that we have for the logic, the supposed this is what I should do in polite culture, it will add up and it will lead to inflammation and it will lead to a variety of secondary health consequences. Let's finish off with the quote. So the healthy person accepts his emotions, the schizoid denies his feelings while the neurotic dismisses them. The body is abandoned when the irrational is denied and feeling is repressed. To reclaim the body, an individual must accept the irrational within themselves. Alexander Lowen is very clever in how he's framed that because he's writing to someone who's got repressed anger or repressed emotion in any particular context and rationally because they're caught up in the rational mind, they see that anger response or that sadness response as irrational and out of proportion because they haven't got contact with the unconscious wounds which have yet to be resolved of five or ten years in their childhood where a very similar emotional texture which isn't complex. It's not, it's not a complex emotion. Even if the situation was complex and there's a big memory of something happened between your brother and sister and then there was this family holiday and then there was this thing of moving school, the exact context isn't important. It's the moment of you being a small child and having that same arising of anger and you wanted to scream or something was happening. Toddlers are very expressive because they do this instantly. If they're upset, you're going to know about it right away. It's interesting that we call it the terrible twos. It's actually when ego formation starts to really come online. As the ego starts to come online, there's a sense of, at least an infantile sense of boundaries. And this is my identity and I want what I want and I need what I need. So of course, when you get denied the ice cream or you're forced to go to bed at a time that you dislike, the toddler within protests. The toddler's ego has yet to be repressed to the point where they take that genuine feeling and they because they're also learning to speak. It's so interesting, the timing of human development right there, because the two-year-old, we're encouraging them to learn new words, and they learn new words at a rapid pace. Age two, age three, age four, it's incredible psychological growth, and also very sad, very tragic, perpetual emotional stunting where authentic emotions are deadened, and we are conditioned, especially when we start going to preschool, and especially when we go to elementary or primary school, age four, age five, those first years in the classroom where we are told to sit down and shut up and the little boy or the little girl is in physical pain because they haven't got the ability to regulate their water intake at break time and they drank way too much water and uh-oh, it's two hours of classes until lunchtime and they need to go to the toilet and the teacher says, no, 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 you should have gone at break time. They're in physical pain and they learn to suck it up as a little five-year-old boy or girl and it is so f up. I'm personally angry that that's a pattern because that one story isn't the full history of what happens to us in our childhood, but multiple instances like that lead us to the point where we have so heavily repressed our ability to assert ourselves. Not only do we lose the ability to express it outwardly, we lose the ability to even listen to our genuine emotions. And that's so tragic. 
It applies to sadness and depression and anxiety, and it applies to dreaming states of wanting more from life and believing in things which are greater than the situation that we're presented. All of it gets deadened, and we reclaim the body by being honest with our emotions. And the people pleaser, the reasonable man or woman, or even the person who's kind of in contact with their anger, but they've still got these compulsive, self-damaging, angry kind of feelings, or maybe the occasional thought spiral towards suicide or self-harm, all of it indicates unexpressed anger. So how do we work with this practically? How do we go into repressed rage without being carried away on some kind of like volcanic surge of never-ending destruction? Well, fortunately, in both my personal experience of years of working with clients, years and years of working on my own anger from about age 18 or so, I started actively doing bioenergetics. So over a decade of, okay, I'm going to do bioenergetics and work with my own repressed anger. I have learned so much along the way. And I can say with almost 100% confidence, I don't know you obviously as an individual in your exact individual situation, but every single client journey that I've seen, and also by Alexander Lowen's admission, people who are worried that when they tap into the anger, they'll never be able to stop. Or if they're working with a therapist, if they tap, in, tap into the anger, they're going to overwhelm the therapist. If they've got a good therapist, it doesn't happen. Of course, bad therapists may be. It doesn't happen. You won't lose control. You step into the space with consciousness and you say, okay, I'm setting aside half an hour now to do this bioenergetic exercise on my anger. If at any moment it starts to feel like I've hit the ceiling of uh, consciousness and control, you can bring yourself back down. You're not a child. You're not going to regress into stupidly infantile space where you have zero control over your emotions. It might feel like you're a two or three year old having a temper tantrum, but you are still a very alert, very aware individual who has the ability to meta process without getting caught up in emotion. Otherwise you'd be doing yourself a massive disservice to your own ability to actually control your emotions and surprise by as bit of a tragic irony that controlling your emotions has led you to this point in the first place. You haven't lost the ability to just repress it and contain it. You'll be able to put that lid on if the steam gets too hot. So don't worry about it. Although as a safety disclaimer, if you are particularly worried, especially if you've had a physical or sexual assault and you've got lots of rage around, I, 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 I would be terrified to know what happens if I go into that space alone please find a therapist that you can work with, or at least a facilitator, a bioenergetic workshop, a group space, some kind of physical container where you're not left to your own devices when it is rage. I'm not saying that rage is right or wrong, but I would say that there is a justifiable cause and effect response if you to want to kill the person who's raped you. If you've been beaten and hurt and assaulted, to want to hurt the other person in the same way they hurt you, that is a valid feeling. I'm not saying you should do it. I definitely don't think that we should do eye for an eye, someone you, someone that's of it, that's that's ancient. That's thousands of years of history and I'm gonna go into Bible law, why the Bible law was something that came through in the two thousands and the shift in moral consciousness. We'll leave that for now. Yeah. The point is rage can be brought through in this space and you have the ability to tap into that on your own but if you really do need support please go and get support don't go into it completely on your own you don't have to it's worth it okie dokie let's go into practical exercises to deal with rage but in my own story i worked through my own repressed anger issues primarily through a mixture of weightlifting and physical strengthening where i physically unlocked my body so a general all around awakening of the body the ability to do things like an overhead press or to be able to push aggressively to be able to jump to be able to activate myself that was so necessary for multiple years to just bring a general baseline aliveness into my body i couldn't have skipped that stage so although there is particular bioenergetic exercises to come through you're in a much more stable position to work with intense repressed emotion especially repressed anger if you're physically enlivened and more vital. If you've been sedentary for years and you're not exercising and you don't know what it's like to jump high, jump forwards, be able to throw a punch or throw a kick, they're some of the biggest gains. It's not directly therapeutic, but it's indirectly therapeutic. I have seen in multiple client journeys this natural arising of someone. I've worked with a variety of different people who do a variety of different martial arts, but it sometimes happens that within a mentorship, someone will get the impulse of, hmm, 
I've really been thinking of getting into MMA. I've been thinking of getting into Muay Thai. I've been thinking of getting into Jiu Jitsu. What do you think about that? And I'm like, well, we've just been talking about all your rage towards your mother. I think it's completely appropriate to go through an ego evolution of sparring with other women and getting that feeling of safely containing the emotion. Of course I support it. And I've seen transformation after transformation of young women or old men, like any age in particular, if you've never done it, if you've never gone into sparring space, if you've never spent half an hour kicking the heavy bag or holding the pads and going backwards and forwards, it is a liberation. I remember the first time I did a variety of, I was training Muay Thai quite heavily last year, and uh, I remember the first times that I was sparring in Muay Thai. I'm a grown man. I'm comfortable in my body. Got a decade of training. I'm decently athletic. I'm tall. I'm strong. It was all fine. I had a regressive moment in my head of like, holy this feels like one of those moments from the past where I am in danger and an old abusive situation is repeating all over again. And there I am with my gloves and I feel like I've shrunk down to little Jordan who's terrified of the situation that's about to happen. And I got through it. I did one round for like three or four minutes. I was like, oh shit, I need to, I need to sit down. Holy shit, I skipped the next round and I did it again. And that continued for the first three or four times I went sparring. And because I've had that experience, I can now pre-warn clients that hey if you've got some physical trauma some trauma some abuse some assault expect that that will happen know that you're safe you're in a safe environment everyone's there the majority of people who do martial arts are really nice people and they'll get it if you say hey, that's too much i need, I need to stop i need to stop called they're going to give you a hug or at the very least sit down with you and talk with you most people in martial arts gyms it's it's a very wonderful space if you find the right gym it's it's a wonderful place to be this kind of work, this practical, not direct therapeutic approach towards repressed anger, but using fitness and sport and exertion as more of a baseline building, but also very liberating process to go and literally throw a, pr a punch, to literally learn how to exert with increasing force. Obviously, I'm you know, playing around here. I'm not throwing the perfect punch right here, but to move from slow to hard to then actually cause some force. And that first time in your life potentially, where you throw a powerful punch and someone moves back from it, or you throw a shot to someone's body and they go, ah, some part of you from earlier on, some inner child clicks and goes, oh, I can defend myself and this is okay. And then you both laugh, laugh afterwards and you, you bump fists and you move on. And like, oh, sh I just healed that wound I've been carrying for 20, 30, 40 years. I recommend it get into some martial arts classes, go into space where anger is fun, where it's something which is consensually engaged with and people use, you know, playful violence in a way which is constructive and bonding. I recommend that as an absolute foundation to both men and women. And interestingly, the majority of clients I've worked with have then been like, I want to get into martial arts. It has been women and it's been women who've had unfortunately tragic experiences quite often with various abuses and assaults. And I see the change in character. They go from a disempowered victim state to an empowered and embodied state because they put in the effort a few times per week for multiple months to actually change their state. They change their state via the doing of martial arts. So if, if you do want the easiest possible shortcut, go get yourself into your MMA gym, your boxing gym, your Muay Thai gym, or even Jiu Jitsu. Jiu Jitsu is a bit less explosive because it's, it's not a striking sport, but there's still something about pressure and there's something about working with the pressure and the give and take, which is still similar. It's not quite the same. I'd recommend striking for therapeutic purposes, but all of it's going to be good. In terms of non-gym based things, I also went through a period of time where I was taking cold showers every single morning while I was at university. And the majority of times when I take that cold shower, because I had so much repressed anger and so much rage and so much was going on, I would silently scream in the shower. I'd be there under the shower. And of course, Maybe I was just being a bit of a wuss about the cold, but I'd be like this and I would like that full, full expression. If I'm willing to do it in this course and hundreds of people see this, you can do it while you're standing naked in the shower and let off the f***ing steam. If you're at that dangerous point where you feel like it's really building up a few minutes per day, one good silent scream. People scream in their car as well. This is another thing. Screaming unlocks literally that repressive concrete barrier that gets caught in the throat. Find a way to do this. You can also scream into pillows. You can scream out in nature. 
make sure you're doing it in a place where, of course, you're not going to cause harm or be um, causing disturbances or people are going to get worried about nearby. Go to bioenergetic workshops in your local city. There's a variety of ways to do it, but the principle of screaming, the principle of vocalizing, even just getting to the point where this is so, so powerful to go through, you will find if you commit to this process of articulating your repressed anger, most people, especially men, especially men, we will be in a situation where we will scream and at a certain moment the scream will end and we will feel that space open up and we will start to sob if we're honest with our emotions. I don't want you to just open up and just cry because it's okay to be a man. I want you to be f***ing honest with your emotions. The scream is honesty and then it changes and the sadness and then maybe another scream and then maybe some more tears. That's a genuine healing path. The same principle is true for women. Women tend to be a lot less repressed in the ability to move between emotional states. Of course, everyone's unique, but men tend to be particularly compartmentalizing. An angry man will deny that he has sadness, whereas often when I work with women, they will be able to be sad and they also admit quite readily, I have a lot of repressed anger. Just an interesting psychological trait about how I think compartmentalization works between the various psyches. Interesting process. The principle is explore your voice. Silent screams, of course, it's still opening up that gesture. We'll see this in the mirror work exercise as well. Opening up the gesture, it physically unfreezes all of that stuck emotion, but it also articulates the pain. You don't need to hold on to it. Once you've done the screaming, there's a variety of ways to, of course, continue the bioenergetic trend. The classic exercises, I think there's some examples and illustrations in this book. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. In which case, I think I might be wasting our time. Aha, here we go. So we've got the bioenergetic arch, which you can pause and see, of course, read this book for yourself. That's an opening exercise where you lie on the bioenergetic stool, or even you're just like this. And if you hold the position where you see my chest, you'll start, you'll start vibrating. I haven't done that in a long time. Shocking almost undoing it spontaneously in this lesson and just how much repressed energy is still there. Maybe I've got a scream or two that's been buried down. Maybe there's some stress in there. I already feel better. My energy is different from 10 seconds of performative arch. I've had clients do this every single day for about five minutes at a time for just one week. Breakthrough experiences. That's one of the standing postures, which is a bit less of a direct expression of rage. That's more of a every emotion will come out. Sometimes people sob, sometimes people scream. It's a nice physical stress position. Take some of the principles of uh, trauma release exercises. You can try that yourself. Of course, we have the literal uh, getting the tennis ball, tennis ball, getting the tennis racket or the baseball bat and hitting the bed and letting out the obviously literal rage. You have the kicking, you have the punching, all of the striking aspects. The crucial element is to do it with feeling. In fact, I'm going to bring out the towel. Remember this from earlier. One of the best exercises with a towel is to practice wringing it out and to do it with feeling. If you've got rage and if you've got that potential, like, I want to wring their neck, someone hurt you, someone abused you, someone's done something which is a massive disservice to your own boundaries, get a towel to properly, I got proper wringing and it comes up instantly. I'm not even thinking of anything in particular. There's no narrative. There's no one I'm thinking of. Just the gesture itself. You also have a pulling gesture. There's a variety of things you can do where you can obviously then go into a situation where you're nunchucking with the towel. <laughs> you can get playful with it, but also angry. You can go from wringing to pulling some people. They'll start biting on the towel. I'm not going to do it in this exercise. I think there's only so far that I can go, but realistically, I would. I feel like, you know, there's where the limit is for a video like this. You can go into a state, and I've seen people go into these states. I have been to bioenergetic workshops where it's a group experience. People will tap so deep into their primal consciousness, they will bite down on the towel, and they will start growling like a wild animal. It seems insane. It's not something that you should be doing every single day. But to have that experience once in your life of biting down and feeling the bite, feeling that, that, that impulse, which is often repressed within the one-year-old, the two-year-old, were slapped on the wrist, and don't bite, biting's for bad boys or bad girls, to reaccess the ability to bite to bite off life, to chew off life, to get what you want. That's a powerful exercise. It's something which 
isn't appropriate for some people. For other people, you're going to be like, wow, I'm going to be like, you're going to pause the video right away, go and run and get a towel from the kitchen and then start biting down it and savagely foaming at the mouth. And for 10 minutes, you're going to do that. And afterwards, you're going to be like, wow, that was powerful. You do it one more time and then you realize you suddenly stop biting your nails and you're no longer thinking about harming yourself or harming someone else. It was all resolved in the body. The towel exercise is interesting. Using the rackets, using the baseball bats. You can be in exercises with other people. Another exercise with a towel is like an empowerment exercise. Is if you have one person holding one end and one person holding the other end and you're in a group workshop space, one person pulls it and say, it's mine. The other person pulls it and says, it's mine. It's very regressive. That like, it's mine. No, it's mine. No, it's mine. That pulling and taking, that tussling, of course, you work with each other. But just that completion gesture of, that's mine. You're claiming it's the reverse of the push. The reverse of the push is to aggressively pull towards you. And if you're not capable of aggressively pulling towards you the things that you want in your life with a level of understanding that I'm, I don't want you to go out and maraud in the world, but if you have the desire to get a promotion at work or the, the willingness to go and meet someone in a public place, someone you might want to have a romantic experience with, maybe it's someone that you're seeing like, hey, I, I really need to approach that man or woman. Like, that ability to pull, of course, not literally pulling, but starting the conversation, psychologically being like, I'm going to bring this possibility into my reality. That pull, if you practice the aggressive version of that, every single level of emotional calibration along that spectrum will become easier. It's easier to get what you want. It's easier to push away what you don't want. This is the power of working with repressed anger. And you can see just how long this video is and how how engaged I am in this topic, I think this is without a doubt some of the most powerful inner work that anyone could possibly do because anger is socially stigmatized, culturally stigmatized in a way where we do not realize how life affirmative anger and rage can be. There is a healthy, righteous, assertive energy which we have repressed into the shadow, the ability to say no, I don't want that get off me. That's not for me. We saw what happened a few years ago with a situation where everyone was forced to be good boys and good girls and wear their masks and do what they're told. And there are very, very, very many narratives around that particular situation. But what we learned from the pandemic is that people, when they get repressed and when you're told to sit down and shut up and literally muzzle yourself with a mask, it does not lead to positive mental health. There's a variety of situations there just to focus in on one element. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I have my personal beliefs. You might have your personal beliefs, but the simple act of muzzling yourself with a mask and not being able to speak clearly, and especially children who experience this, little boys and little girls who not only are in the classroom where they can't go to the toilet because they, whatever, they missed their opportunity, they then wear this mask and they can't breathe and they can't speak. It is so heartbreaking to think about the experience that's already been embedded into their nervous system. I could almost cry thinking about it. I think it's so wrong. Health and safety, precautions, whatever might have been appropriate, but the way that we went about it on a global level caused so much trauma to children, teenagers, and adults. And exercises like these, the ability to speak up, push out, pull back, all of this is therapeutic, and it is such a shame that this isn't more well known. It's all we can do for a single lesson. I'll leave this in your hands. At the very least, make the time in your schedule to explore. And please, if you haven't already, The Betrayal of the Body by Alexander Lowen. This is a masterpiece. One of my top 10 books in the library, I'd say. I've done all I can do in one lesson, shared some of my story. Anger and rage is something to be reclaimed. And if we reclaim it in a way which is conscious and honest and we are not lying about the things that are hurting us, maybe we'll experience a healthier, happier and more authentic identity which we get to share with the world. And I want that for you. I want that for anyone. I'll see you over in the next lesson. I can't speak on your behalf, but I know that my anger is already starting to dissipate and float away through my fingers from watching that wonderful shadow work library guided exercise from module six, where we're looking at somatic therapy. And if you want to continue the shadow integration process, join me for some psychosynthesis and the three layers of the unconscious mind. You saw this 
previewed in the Mega Book Curriculum Review Hyper Insane Book Dump episode. If you haven't seen that already, or you want to go join me on the Psychosynthesis Integration Tour, you can click this playlist link over here, where we're going to be doing even more shadow work, at even more depth, with the support of some fantastic material. I'll see you over there.